Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our History of Medicine lecture. Um, tonight, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Trotman. Uh, Paul is uh, well known to us, not only as a doctor, but as a filmmaker. Um, but tonight, he's going to be talking about Dr. Willem Koff. Uh, and I won't say any more about him, but uh, he's the most interesting character, as is Paul, but he will uh, introduce him, I'm sure. So please welcome Paul Trotman. Hello, uh, I'm Paul, uh, and I'm going to be telling you about Willem J, also known as Pim to his friends, Kolf. Uh, he was a physician. He was born in uh, 1911 in the Netherlands uh, and grew up on his father's uh, knee. His father was the medical director at Beekbergen TV Sanatorium. Um, and uh, he loved going in to work with his dad and meeting the, pa the patients and talking to them. But he had a great deal of difficulty coping it with it when the patients died. And he nearly didn't go to med school purely because of that. But the end, in the end, he did go to med school. And uh, he ended up in Gröningen Hospital in the northeast um, and here you can see there's uh, Big Bergen. Uh, I'm sorry the uh, laser point is not working very well but uh, and you can also see Hampen which is the other important place in this part of the story. Um, he uh, fell in love at an early age. Uh, this is Janka Hiedekopper. Uh, she became his wife but uh, he became a little obsessed with her at uh, high school and would follow her around, probably be called stalking nowadays. Um, but uh, they did eventually become a couple and were married in 1937, which is about the time he was due to start his internship. Uh, he did his internship in Gröningen Hospital. Um, he didn't actually have a lot of choice because Gröningen was the only hospital that would take married interns. Uh, there were no women doctors in training uh, in Netherlands at the time, and no other hospital would take you as an intern if you were married. As a bonus, they also didn't pay you. Um, so uh, he was given four beds to look after, and he worked for this guy, Professor Polak Daniels. Um, Daniels was very supportive of his interns, and particularly of them pursuing their interests. And uh, under Polak Daniels, um, they had a patient who had peripheral edema, and uh, Koch developed a device that squeezed the legs from distal to proximal in an effort to reduce the edema. Sadly, it didn't work. Um, however, he did quite early on in his career meet a patient who was going to have a massive effect on his life. This patient was Jan Bruning. He was a 22-year-old man. He was bright yellow, uh, had urea crystals around his uh, nose and his mouth, uh, was massively hypertensive with a blood pressure of 245 on 120, uh, and was going blind. He had end-stage renal failure for which there was no treatment. Uh, and in those days, patients were basically sent home to die. Um, Miss, uh, Dr. Kolf at the time uh, was talking to the, the patient's mother who said, at least he doesn't have cancer. And sadly had to break the news to her that yes, he might not have cancer, but he had uremia and he was going to die. Um, he became a little fixated on this and you'll notice that fixation is a bit of a, a pattern uh, in Colf's life. Um, I suspect that nowadays he would be described as being on the spectrum. Uh, but he worked out that if they could remove 20 grams of urea from his patient a day, the patient would survive. Um, and he went and he spent the, the, the last few days of this patient's life in the medical library at Groningen reading about renal failure. And he discovered this man. This man is Thomas Graham. Uh, he was a Scottish researcher. Um, and he discovered that he could make a rudimentary semi-permeable membra membrane made from vegetable parchment coated with albumin. Uh, 
and that if he put a concentrated solution on one side and a weak solution on the other, that the uh, contents of the solution would diffuse through. And he called this dialysis uh, in 1861. Uh, nobody managed to make any use whatsoever of this uh, invention for many, many years. In the 1920s, uh, two guys in America and some others in Europe, um, but we'll fix on the guys Roundtree and Turner, they started experimenting with this as a way of cleaning blood. They used collodion as their uh, membrane and hirudin as their anticoagulant. Now, there are a bunch of problems with these. Firstly, collodion is brittle and cracks and breaks, and it was really very unsuccessful, even in animal models. Secondly, hirudin, which um, they used as an anticoagulant to stop the blood clotting as it went through the machine, um, might work in animals, but in humans, it gives lung fibrosis uh, and tends to be slightly fatal, which is why we now use it only for, for uh, topical use, uh, uh, hemorrhoid cream and thrombophlebitis cream. Um, he got quite a lot of support from this from his boss, and his boss said, well, if you're interested in that sort of thing, go and see Prof. Robert Brinkman. Um, and remember, this is now 20 years later after the, the uh, uh, experiments in the States. And two things happened here. The first, weirdly enough, was sausages. Um, I don't know if you know, but sausages in the olden days were wrapped in uh, animal gut to make the sausage skins. But later, this was replaced with celluloid. Now, celluloid, again, had been around for some time. The first celluloid was made in 1855 in Birmingham, England, by a guy called Alexander Parks. He called it Parkseen, as you do, and showcased it at the 1862 International Exhibition in London, where judges were singularly unimpressed, and he was only awarded, awarded the bronze medal. Uh, his company subsequently went bankrupt, but somebody else bought up the, the, um, the, the rights to it and started making sausages out of it. Now, what they discovered was that um, uh, Celluloid was a far better semi-permeable membrane. It was flexible, they could wrap it, they could sterilize it, and it wasn't as brittle. So they developed a new device. Uh, this had celluloid instead of collodion, and they were going to use heparin instead of hirudin as an anticoagulant. Uh, they had a vertical drum that sat in a vat of salt solutions, and they would put the blood in at the, the plan was to put the blood in at the top and pump it around and have it come out of the bottom. They tested it on their own blood to start with. Uh, Kolf took 45 centimeter length of sausage skin, tied a knot in one end, uh, put 20 mils of his blood into it, added a few drops of urea for the experiment, tied a knot at the other end and put it in a solution of salt, uh, saline solution. And he found that very, very quickly, within about 15 minutes, he worked out that all of the urea had come out of his blood and had gone into the solution. Brilliant. They've got a, a, a potential concept that they can use to clean somebody's blood. Um, he worked out that they need a 10 meter length of, um, uh, of the, the sausage skin to wrap around the drum, and then it should be fine. Um, couple of problems. The main one being that the bearings sat in a salty solution and within about two minutes they rusted solid and they couldn't then get the drum to turn in the solution. Uh, the other problem was that squeezing the blood down the tubing uh, damaged the blood. So this never really got beyond the, 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 the model stage. Um, the next thing that happened was that um, Kolf's grandfather-in-law died. Uh, and he died on the 1st of May, 1940. Now, any of you who have a little bit of a, uh, an interest in history will notice the dates there climbing up. Uh, so they decided that they would go to the funeral. They left their newly born nine-month-old son with a nanny and headed to The Hague on May the 9th, 1940 for the funeral. Uh, the next day was, of course, the 10th of May, 
1940. Now, in the Netherlands, they were all pretty confident that the World War was not going to affect them. There were a lot of marshes around Netherlands that the Germans would never be able to get their tanks through. And they were a neutral country anyway. So nobody would ever invade a, a neutral country. Well, until the 10th of May 1940. And sadly, the train that they took, took to The Hague on the 9th of May 1940 was the last train to run for some time because this is what happened the next day. The Germans invaded the Netherlands. They had a front seat view from the top of the house they were staying at and literally watched fighters and bombers fighting it out in the sky over their head and were narrowly missed by bullets. Sadly, at the same time as the Germans invaded, Polak Daniels, uh, Kolf's mentor, uh, who was Jewish, and his wife committed suicide back in Groningen. Um, what he did do with his time here was he went to the funeral, which uh, by all reports was a little bit of a Keystone Cops affair, um, as they were told to drive as quickly as they could to the funeral, because anybody who was driving on the streets was a target to be shot at. Uh, so they went to the funeral, and Kolf then turned up at the nearest hospital, where he bumped into an old mate of his and said, said to them, what do you need me to do? And they said, we need blood. Can you set up a blood bank? So he got a little distracted at this point and spent the next four days with a sniper and a driver driving around uh, The Hague, acquiring all the stuff he needed to set up a blood bank. And within four days, they were taking their first donations of blood and uh, the blood bank was set up. Um, it must have been a, a, a string and sellotape kind of affair, but it provided the blood that they needed because the town looked pretty much like this. Um, at the end of his time in The Hague, uh, Kolf climbed to the top of the hospital building and could literally see the firestorm that was Rotterdam in the distance. Um, so he returned to uh, Groningen and found that his beloved boss was to be replaced by a gentleman with a somewhat grand title of Kreutz Wendelich von dem Born. Uh, this was a, a, a sort of an invented title that the Nazi sympathizers in Netherlands were, were uh, prone to giving themselves. Um, and he said, I won't work for a Nazi and resigned on the spot. Uh, he did, however, have six months grace because ironically, von dem Born had TV. Uh, and TV is a little bit of a recurring theme here. Um, and his start was delayed by six months. This was enough time for Kolf to finish his internship and qualify as a medical specialist. Um, a job came up at this place. This is Campen Hospital, also known as, and I'll just have a go at pronouncing this, at the Engelenburg Stichting. It was an 80 bed hospital and he was the youngest applicant for the job. There were seven others applied for the job. Uh, he was the only one who made demands. He said, we need a new x-ray machine. This one's a bit rubbish. Uh, I want a, an EKG machine, which has just been invented and thank you for getting me one and a laboratory and staff. Uh, and he started work there the day before the new Nazi head started at Groningen. Uh, he meets Maria Torelli, she is one of the charge nurses on the medical ward uh, and becomes a big supporter of his, uh, shows him around the hospital and he is given an office. Uh, and he starts working with the resistance, sort of, again, gets in the way of, of his research a little bit, um, but he discovers he has a bit of a knack for helping people to fake illness. Um, uh, this is a bottle of picric acid. And he found that if you give somebody picric acid to drink, they go yellow and it looks like they have jaundice and you can pass them off as having jaundice as long as the subsequent physicians to examine the patient don't look too closely. He discovered that if you took a unit of blood out of a patient and then gave it back to them to drink, they would vomit the blood quite quickly and would look very suspiciously like they had an ulcer. And if you check their blood count, you'd find that they were anemic. And uh, in the days when it wasn't easy to get a gastroscopy, 
um, it looked very much like they had an ulcer. He also discovered that if he took lipiodol, lipiodol which is the, was the uh, uh, x-ray contrast in use at the time, gave it to somebody to inhale it, their x-ray looked suspiciously like they had TB, and then it just took a little bit of sleight of hand with a sample from somebody who actually did have TB, and their sputum looked right as well. Very convenient. Um, they also performed an unnecessary appendicectomy uh, on a, a, a Polish soldier who was at risk of going being sent back to the front. And at another time, he provided ether to somebody who needed to be unconscious uh, for slightly complicated reasons, but they were involved in um, uh, food stuff, um, uh, ration cards, and they knew that they were going to be robbed of the ration cards uh, sometime in the next couple of days and wanted to make sure that they weren't there to get the blame. Uh, so they were found unconscious. Um, meanwhile, uh, research started up again. Uh, and these two people, uh, Manika van der Leij and Bob van Nordwijk, uh, were both hired to come and work for him. Uh, Maria, uh, uh, Kolf slightly naively said, are you a Nazi? Because uh, I work with the resistance, um, which to me, if she was a Nazi, was probably a great way of getting caught. Uh, she ran the laboratory, and her job was to get uh, urea and potassium measurements done as quickly as possible, because they needed them during the dialysis treatments that were going to be coming um, to see how effective they were being. Um, Bob was um, uh, also from Groningen. He had been banned to medical school after spending 18 months in a German prison camp um, because he was involved in writing a seditious anti-Nazi newspaper while he was a student. Um, he originally uh, declined the job and then on his way back to Groningen thought, now, nah, you know, that sounds like a really good idea. And literally phoned Kolf from a, um, from a, a corner telephone and said, uh, I sent you a letter to say I don't want to take the job. Can I change my mind? And Kolf said, yeah, as long as you're here on Monday. Uh, and bring your typewriter. It turned out that Bob was a really good typist and uh, Kolf was not. Uh, and so he was very useful for, uh, as well as being involved in building the machinery to uh, type up the results. Uh, he was also a very fastidious person, which was really very helpful when you're trying to get something to work that's never worked before. They set up their, their research in room 13 um, until uh, Maria Torelli said, you know, if you're doing an experimental treatment, uh, and you're doing it in room 13, that might put people off. So they changed the number to room 12A. Um, the, the, the first dialysis machine was made with lots of leftover bits and pieces, but the first bit they needed was a large enamel bath. And at this point, uh, uh, Kolf had a 5 a.m. visit to the Birk Enamel Works, uh, also in the town, and um, had a meeting with Hendrik Burke and E.C. Van Dyke, the engineers there, um, who uh, said, you know, if you put the, the roller on its side, you could have the bearings out of the dialysis fluid and they wouldn't rust. So the first design looked something like this, uh, with everything horizontal. Um, and the finished machine looked like this. Uh, this is Maria Torelli uh, uh, posing as a patient. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the machine now. So this is a, a, a model, I think, of the machine, but it's in color. And it's the second generation machine because you can see it's got wooden slats. Uh, they were no longer able to get the metal uh, to have a, a corrugated uh, uh, barrel. So how did the machine work? They had sausage skins, two to three square meters wrapped around it. Kolf had brought about 20 boxes of the things with him from Groningen when he moved. It had a motor to drive it that was salvaged from an old sewing machine. It had uh, the cooling connector from, in fact, two of them, from a Ford car, which enabled them to connect the static 
bloodline that connected to the patient with the moving drum of the machine. It had kettle elements to keep the dialysis fluid warm. Uh, bed slats made by a local wheelwright uh, made up the barrel of it. And aluminium salvaged from a crashed aeroplane that was shot down over the town uh, made up the legs and the struts. And the enamel bath was made by Burke uh, in his enamel works. He was uh, contracted by the Nazis to be making pots and pans for the soldiers and was under strict instructions that he wasn't to do anything else so it was made at night, and when Kolf offered to pay for it, he was told, you can't pay for it. We can't put you through the books because we'd get caught, and then we'd be shot. It took 70 litres of dialysis fluid, which on the longer dialysis sessions uh, would be changed several times. Okay, the first patients. The first patient was patient zero. Um, his name was Gustav Böhler. Um, he was a, a non-existent patient. He was a Jewish man who they'd admitted to the hospital and then disappeared uh, because other, if he was known as being Jewish, he would have been taken away and killed. Um, he had prostate cancer, which had uh, invaded his ureters uh, and were blocking off his kidneys. Um, they were so confident that uh, the dialysis would work that he was given the last rites before they started. Um, and yes, in fact, it didn't work. Um, they drew uh, 50 mils of blood out of him, put it through the machine. All the urea came out of the, the, the blood, and they then injected it back into him and then took out another 50 mils. And they did this for about 20 minutes. Um, and did nowhere near enough to make any difference whatsoever, and he died shortly after. Uh, the next patient was Jenny, Jenny Scrivener. Um, she had glomerulonephritis, and she survived for 26 days and 12 sessions. Um, they took a lot of urea out of her, um, and her urea did fall, and her blood pressure did fall. Um, and they realized at this point that they were definitely on the right track. Um, now, I've lost my notes here. Um, the next patient was Greta Van Cleef, and the next patient, number seven, was a guy called Termulin. All of these patients died. Ah, great, thank you. Greta had scarlet fever. Um, she, it looked really good that she was going to survive, but she died of pneumonia. Uh, Jenny, uh, the previous patient, my apologies, uh, survived 12 ses sessions, but unfortunately, the IV access that they were using so damaged her vessels that they ran out of access and were forced to stop. Um, Kolf was really upset about every single one of the patients who died. Her in particular, her father came to see him afterwards and said, can I pay you? Thank you for doing everything you did. And he declined payment and he declined payment, in the end settled for a tiny fee, uh, but it was enough to give him the, momentous, uh, to give him the, the momentum to go on. Um, Termulin had, was a young man, he had staph sepsis, and he started to look really good. He started to pee even and make more urine, but unfortunately his staph sepsis in the days before antibiotics managed to kill him. Um, there were multiple problems in all of these first seven to ten patients. Um, they, they had um, uh, uh, rigors from the heparin anticoagulant because it was dirty and uh, quite an early poorly extracted uh, version of heparin. Um, the uh, the uh, sausage skins would develop leaks. Uh, and if you mix blood in salt water with something continually stirring it, you end up with it acting like a detergent. And they had a problem with literally vast amounts of pink foam over, overlapping the edges of the baths and spilling onto the floor. And they... Uh, started walking around on planks on bricks so that they didn't have to walk through the, the bloody foam. Um, patient 10 had sulfonamide crystal nephropathy. Sulfonamides were a, a very early version of um, antibiotics, but unfortunately, they tended to crystallize out in the kidneys and poison the kidneys. He did actually recover, but they didn't think it was due to the dialysis. 
So here's another couple of pictures of the dialysis. Um, the, the first is, is another person uh, pretending to be a patient. Uh, and the second is a, a drawing by one of the engineers involved in the, in the uh, process of Mr. Snoop um, of Colf with, the, with uh, this mad looking machine. Um, they did postmortems on all of the patients. Um, some died of cardiac failure, some recurrence of infection. Remember, there were no antibiotics. Somebody else died of a bleed from the anticoagulation. Somebody else died from pneumonia. Most were so sick that they probably were too sick to survive the procedure. There was one slightly ironic patient who had a kidney cancer and they removed his kidney only to find at postmortem that the surgeons had removed his only kidney. Um, remember, this was before ultrasound and CT and before it was easy to see kidneys at all. Um, they did smuggle machines to other towns, uh, taking them apart and taking them a bit at a time. Um, they took one to Amsterdam uh, and the patient that they attempted to treat there was in a hospital bed and couldn't get through the door to the machine. So they had to lever the door off the frame to make it wide enough to get the patient in. Um, at this point, they realized that they were on a slightly wrong track. They were looking for that the moment they were treating mostly patients with chronic renal failure, whose kidney function probably wasn't ever going to improve. And what they needed were patients with acute renal failure, um, who there was a chance that if they rested the kidneys, the patient would improve. Um, here's one more picture of them. This is a slightly later picture, but it's Colf with one of the early machines. Um, unfortunately, at this point, war gets in the way again, and there are shortages of drugs and soap and bandages and rubber tubing that they needed to connect the patients to the machine, needles that they needed to connect the patient to the rubber tubing, and sausage skins. Um, they'd already been sharpening the, the needles for reuse, but once you sterilize a needle 15 or 20 times, the steel goes brittle, and they tended to break. They also tended to go rusty on the inside, which caused more problems. Um, so eventually they replaced both the rubber tubing and the needles with glass. Um, and they, were, they cut down to the vessels and sewed the glass tubing into the vessel and uh, then bled the patient out that way. Um, the sausage skins, uh, they were using American sausage skins and they had to replace them with uh, it's said inferior German sausage skins, which are much more brittle and were more prone to breaking and more prone to leaking. Um, as the war progressed, more and more of what Kolf was doing was illegal. He was giving fake information on the wards and patients to the Nazis, pretty much. Uh, if you asked him to only give the stuff that was true, he would tell you, well, actually, none of what we're sending to the Nazis is true. Um, Campen Hospital became a bit of a center of the resistance, and Kolf was at the center of all of that. He was involved, this place, this is the Corn Market Gate in Campen. Uh, he was involved as the getaway driver on an assassination attempt on Bolsveld, the Nazi head of police. Um, in the end, they aborted the attempt because for the first time ever, the chief of police had outriders and security with him. Um, and so they, they pulled the pin and literally drove off at the last second. Um, and uh, Kolf says, has said that that moment was the most scared he's ever been. Um, he built a priest hole in his house at home that he could hide in, a gap between the, the, the ceiling and the roof of the upstairs of the house. And they timed getting into it, delaying opening the front door. Um, and he could get up there and be hidden in a minute and a half. And there was a similar priest hole at the hospital above the infectious disease ward. At one point, he was shielding a Jewish boy at his home, who was the son of a colleague in Groningen. Um, and uh, his father-in-law was involved in stealing and re reusing ration cards. Um, I'd like to think that, that he met this person. Uh, this is Audrey Hepburn, uh, who was also involved in the resistance in the Netherlands, uh, just a few miles away. It's very unlikely, though, sadly. She was involved in delivering the resistance newspaper. Uh, she talked to down British pilots, telling them what to do if she was bilingual, and nobody would suspect a, a, a young thing of 14. Um, and she was also involved in the nighttime blackout performances that raised money for the resistance. Just a little aside there. 
in 19, on the 11th of November 1944, the war again gets in the way of the research as a bunch of barges arrived at town in town. There were the first barge to arrive on the 11th of November 1944 had 10,500 men, uh, Dutch men who'd been and boys who'd been rounded up in uh, the Netherlands and were being sent to Germany for work camps, basically a death sentence. Um, it was a horrendous scene. Uh, the barges were full of shivering, half naked, soiled um, men and boys. Um, and it was looking like a complete disaster. Uh, Kolf heads down to the, the, where the barges are moored and talks to the German uh, leader there and says, look, um, we can help you here. You've got a lot of sick men who are going to die before they get to uh, Germany. Why don't I take them off your hands and we'll accommodate them here? Um, he was basically told, if any escape, you'll be shot. Uh, but him, the chief surgeon at the hospital, and as many others as they could find, uh, started work on these men. They put them all through uh, uh, some barracks, uh, and their plan was to declare as many sick as possible, uh, especially at-risk people, Jewish people, resistance people, and people who they could use from the Red Cross. Uh, they were put through the Van Hoitz Kazan barracks, um, and then they were accommodated in every spare space, schools, a furniture factory, um, multiple other spaces uh, that they could find to accommodate them. Uh, they made up fake illnesses. Basically, they were doing what he'd done earlier, but on an industrial scale. Uh, fake illnesses, fake false records, because as long as the records read okay, they reckon they would get away with it. Uh, in the end, 33,674 men and boys came through uh, Kampen on barges. Uh, of them, they managed to sidetrack 1,283 men, um, of whom 800, they faked their illnesses. Just to get it into perspective, 33,674 is one and a half times the population of the whole town. Um, this was, however, the last gasp of the war. Um, as they were accommodating the men, uh, the Nazis said they got word that, that the Nazis were going to make a spot visit to the hospital in Kampen and make sure that they truly were doing what they were saying. Uh, what Kolf decided to do was he decided to, to, to say, to, in, to instead invite them so that the Nazi uh, commander for the town would come on their terms and they'd have a, a little bit of time to set things up. Uh, and they set it up beautifully. Uh, they had in the first ward, they had all the really damaged people, people with limbs missing and that kind of thing. In the second ward, they had a whole lot of people with epilepsy that was very difficult to treat in those days. As they entered the ward, the first patient started to seize, which triggered off a second patient and a third patient and a tenth patient. And the visit was very quickly over as the Nazis could not stump that. Uh, so... Shortly, it, oh, and if you're wondering if this was any risk to them, yes, it really was. Albert Huida Copper, uh, who was uh, Janka Kolf's father, was arrested by the Germans and shot three weeks before the end of the war. And Mr. Snoop, an engineer who made that drawing and who was involved in the production, was also taken by the Nazis, tried to escape, and was shot. Uh, the uh, 17th and 18th of April, 1945, was officially the en end of the war. Um, to protect himself, Kolf had a little arrangement going with the local telephone operator who, when she phoned him, if it was a, uh, a resistance phone call, um, he would say, how is your daughter? And the telephone operator would say, she's fine if the phone was clear and there was nobody listening in, or she's not very well today, if there was somebody listening in. Uh, so he knew he could have his conversation safely. He finally met the phone operator face to face after the war was over. Post war, it wasn't over. Uh, 100,000 Nazi sympathizers over Netherlands were arrested 
and the ones in Kampen were ironically put into the same uh, Van Hoytskazern barracks as the men from the barges. Um, they, 10,000 or 20,000 Dutch people starved to death over the next year. Uh, there were shortages of everything. And as I said, Nazi sympathizers were arrested. One of these was this person. Uh, this is Sophia Schaffstadt, and she had cholecystitis. Uh, now, cholecystitis is normally very easy to treat. Even in those days, you take out the gallbladder. Um, unfortunately, there was not enough resources to do surgery on anybody, let alone a Nazi sympathizer. Um, the local surgeon, Kera, took her to hospital, uh, couldn't take out her gallstones, but gave her antibiotics. And she got sulfonamide crystal nephropathy, same as that uh, previous patient. Uh, nobody wanted to care for her, and she was neglected on the ward, uh, and nobody would look after her. Uh, so on the 11th of September, 1945, she was slipping into a coma uh, uh, with end-stage kidney failure. Uh, she had dialysis for 11.5 hours, and uh, she did not do well. She started chain stoking, which is erratic breathing during the dialysis, about three hours in, but then it picked up. And she did all right. Uh, she was sent back to the ward, and this is the graph that they published of her. And you can see that the graph along the top, you can see where she was dialyzed. They dialyzed to 80 or 90 liters of her blood, and they took out a whole lot of urea. Um, she was sent back to the ward, and it looked like she wasn't going to survive again. Um, she was unconscious on the ward. She wasn't peeing, and they started to prepare to do dialysis on her again. But then she started peeing. She woke up and she said, I'm going to divorce my husband. Um, he was not a Nazi sympathizer and had declined to visit her while she was in hospital. And she survived. So originally, they had written a paper which said, we've treated 16 patients and not a single one of them has survived but we suspect that they will if we keep going. They rewrote it to say, we have had some success. And this was Kolf's thesis, which was accepted. Uh, and this is the whole team. So I think the only picture of the whole team that exists. Um, so what did he go on to do next? He was involved, he moved to the States after the war uh, and was involved in refining the, the uh, process. Uh, this is one of the early uh, cylinder dialyzers, uh, which uh, was much, much smaller, uh, worked on counter current exchange um, and was made as you'd expect from a couple of old tin cans and a bunch of sausage skins. Um, he was involved in heart bypass machines uh, the implantable artificial heart, the Javik 7, that some of us might remember from the, the uh, early 90s. Uh, and he was involved in, um, uh, oops, I've got heart-lung bypass twice, uh, and artificial vision and hearing. Um, this is what a modern dialysis machine looks like. This is the one that I used. Um, and this is the equivalent to the, cylind to the, the roll it rotating drum. Um, this is about, I guess, about 30 centimeters long, uh, much, much smaller. And instead of needing just a whole team to do the dialysis, I just had two assistants um, uh, who would regularly supervise. Um, and there are the references. Um, he said that he could never have done it all without his wife's support. Um, at times when he was working for nothing, um, she was able to support him uh, on her inheritance. She'd inherited some, some shares. Um, uh, and at, at one time in Campen, he was paying several of his assistants because there was no money at the hospital to pay them. Uh, any questions? Thanks for that, Paul. That was fascinating. Where does CAPD, continuous um, ambulatory peritoneal dialysis fit in along with the um, 
that history? It's, it's basically using a different membrane. It's using the, the gut and the omentum as a membrane. Cough was a little bit in the later period involved in um, uh, CAPD as well. Um, interestingly, he, he lived to 97 and uh, Janka uh, divorced him in his early 90s when she realized he was never going to stop trying to invent things. Any other questions? Well, thank you indeed, Paul. That was just wonderful. Very, very interesting indeed. Please join me in thanking Paul for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>